Hello and welcome to Practical Intuition with Kay. This is the show where we are always working to help you truly choose from your heart and uh, as a result, enjoy your life. <laughs> um, welcome to the show. I want to say at the top of the show, I know I, I mentioned this last time, uh, but I think I said it at the very end of, of the sh our show from a few weeks ago, um, the name of it's going to be changing. And uh, so you might want to subscribe to, like you might want to uh, hit subscribe in the whatever podcast app that you listen to this, it, whether it's Spotify or Apple or some other one, um, because when the name changes, uh, if you haven't subscribed, you won't be able to find it, obviously, unless you know the new name. <laughs> um, but my plan is that by the end of 2024, we will be ready to shift to uh, our new our new name. And I think it's a very, like, it's not going to be a whole different show in the sense of a new direction. Um, it'll be maybe a little bit different. I, I feel like it'll it'll be a little bit expanded because... Um, yeah, because I think that's, that's just naturally what's going to happen when it is no longer called practical intuition with K, but is instead called art, creativity, and well-being, which is what the name of it will become. Um, yeah, so thank you for being here and, uh, it's great to see you. Um, great to have you along for the ride. I am K. I am a coach. I'm a good listener. I'm an artist. I am a through hiker who used to need a wheelchair. Um, I am inspiring people to really see what's possible for themselves and go for it. And um, I am the author of a memoir called Waking Up, which is about the journey from wheelchair to walking across England to becoming that through hiker. So, um, I'm glad you're here. Today is the second of our series where we are reading a book together, which is like, what fun. Um, I The feedback I've gotten is really wonderful. Um, I am not just about uh, doing it at all, but about the choice of book and, and um, kind of the way that we're approaching this, which is a few chapters at a time over a longish period of time, which like is, you know, uh, amazing. I, I've noticed in my own life even that it's been really, really helpful as I've encountered, you know, the situations that come up in life. I am thrilled because the sun is out here and I'm also feeling like it's pretty sunny. So I'm going to do what I can to reach over and close the, close the blinds. Let's see if I can do that. I'll probably hear it. Let's see. Nope, that's not helping. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. I was like, it won't be sunny. I don't have to worry about this. <laughs> Which I love because you just know what mother, you never know what mother nature is gonna, gonna give you. So anyway, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, the last time we, we were together, we were, um, reading or we had read and we were now kind of reviewing and looking at, um, our curiosity around, the first uh, two chapters of The Relationship Handbook by George Pransky. Um, we talked a little bit in that first episode too about like, why did I choose this one? Like there's there's a million relationship books. And, and by relationship, I don't mean a spousal relationship only, which um, what I love about this particular book is it's great for any relationship. Is it kids? Is it uh, siblings? Is it parents? Is it is it a spouse? I mean, right. Is it coworkers? Is it friends? Um, our understanding of how we experience relationships is really kind of well illustrated and also um, just done in a way that is really, really empowering. And that's why I chose this book. So uh, what we're reading today or what we've just read is the uh, third, fourth and fifth chapters of the relationship handbook. Uh, links in the link to the book is in the show notes. If you are joining us uh, and you kind of want to grab the book and 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 read along, that's amazing. Some people are just listening along, right? Like for some people, the summary of it is enough. Um, and I'm glad to be here and bring this to you. So, so 
Let's hop in. <laughs> Today we're reading chapters three, four, and five, uh, uh, or we're talking about chapters three, four, and five. Chapter three is called, uh, it's got, I think, maybe one of the best chapter titles in the whole book. It's just such a funny one. Communication. When you need it, it won't work. <laughs> it's just just short and sweet. In fact, it even the, in the book, what they say is, or what George says is, um, it's the shortest chapter in the book because uh, there isn't very much that we need to know or remember about quote communication. And it's funny because he starts off talking about how like we do have this, what, you know, what he believes is a mistaken assumption. Uh, and I've certainly come to believe this too, having known the book now, right? Like having kind of lived this. Um, we have this mistaken assumption that communication is the key to everything. And the truth is that communication is, um, it's important, but not in the way that we think it's important, right? So like communicating negative stuff is not helpful, like is, is how this book kind of presents it. And, uh, it, it isn't the, the method of like, if you are communicating very clearly and very well, something that is damaging, uh, what you're doing in a sense is making, making is doing more damage because now you're communicating that in a clear way. Right. Like, so communicating is a tool. Uh, in fact, I believe in the book that what the way that they reference is like, if you can think of a, of a pipe, right? Um, if a pipe has uh, dirty, sludgy, gross water running through it, um, that is that is what it is, right? Like the, the fact of the pipe isn't going to change what's going through it. If it has clean, delicious, sparkling, amazing water coming through it, um, that can also be carried through a pipe, and the point of the point being that like the communication is the pipe. <laughs> so what really, really matters is what are we, what message are we giving? Is it, is it a message uh, that will be helpful or is it a message that will be um, detrimental, right? To, to this relationship, whichever one it happens to be. And I find this really fascinating because um, we do have this thought that like, Clear communication is what we need. Um, and it's certainly important because it's it is the pipe that carries the message. But uh the whole gist of this book is that the most important thing is the nature of the message, right? Like what does that water look like? What does that water taste like? What is that water? Um, how clean is it? How, how, you know, how pure maybe uh in a in a in a positive sense is it? So um, so that's chapter three. I mean, I really, I feel like, uh, there isn't a lot to say about it. The only thing that I, that I took note from the book, which that George says in the book, but I'm not quoting in this. I'm just, this is really me paraphrasing is in the communication chapter, what you are invited to do, the reader is invited to do is pay attention when we are in low spirits. Um, because that's when we will most be wanting to talk about things. Um, that's when we will be most wishing for support. And sometimes we can have the mistaken thought that like the support will come when we clearly communicate what's wrong inside. And uh, a lot of times what that can do is it can, it can challenge our conversational partner because for all, for any number of reasons, anyway, our mood, our, spirits, I think is the word that, that George uses when we're in low spirits, that's something to notice and be aware of, because then we can decide is this, you know, it, it, it's maybe not a good time to make any decisions or, um, reach for that support that we really, really want when we're in that, like, obviously not from like a therapist, right. Or something, but from, from the people around us who, um, who want us to be well, but aren't, you know, qualified to help us <laughs> create that for ourselves. And those are the people that we most often want to go to when we're, when we're in a low mood. So paying attention to that and knowing that that's not a, the best time to, um, to do that. So I think about, uh, 
uh, someone that I love in my life that I don't have permission to share uh, them, you know, like who they are. But in, within the last year or so, we had an excellent, excellent conversation. And I will say it's a young person. So um, so this for me was even more remarkable, just the learning. Um, they had broken up with a, a significant other. And they were now kind of months later on the other side of that, right? So maybe it was six months after the breakup and it had been a pretty tumultuous breakup. And um, what they shared with me was that there were times in the breakup or, you know, as they were going through that, that they really wanted to go to a bar and get drunk, you know, go to a bar and, and, and just consume alcohol. And they didn't because they felt like they, they also had this understanding from inside of themselves that that would be the worst possible time to do that. And emotions are very similar. Um, it's like the time that we would be most reaching out for support and maybe we're not doing it in super productive ways because we are spilling over with emotion. Maybe we're angry. Maybe we're guilty. Maybe we're <laughs> just feeling so terrible that we 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 want that help, but we're not that good at asking for it, right? So communication in that instance could be could be the tool that brings like a lot of yucky water to someone that we didn't necessarily we we would have wished that we could make a, a better choice, right? Um, yeah, so communication simply the conduit uh, and paying attention to what is being communicated is going to be helpful as we. Um, are in our relationships, you know, and even, I would even say in the relationship that we have with ourselves, um, we'll get into this, uh, in the next, as we're talking about the next chapter here, um, I have a story to share, which has been pretty interesting to, to experience. So, okay. Chapter four is moods, the key to understanding people. And this to me is where this book really begins to get good. Um, because, moods like we i think certainly i used to uh have this mistaken impression or mistaken understanding that a mood is like how the person is right like um moodiness like if you like i'm i don't know if you have had, ever had anyone in your life uh defined maybe by even by others or even by themselves as a moody person right well, the truth is that we all have moods. Our our mood is cycling up and down basically all day and all night. Like, um, and so a mood is simply a feeling state. Like it's it's it is the feeling state that our uh our self, our psyche is currently in. And um another mood could come along at any time. And that for me has been absolutely great, great learning. In fact, I when I remember when I was first, um, when I was training to to hike across England, I I think I've said this pretty frequently on the show that a lot of the growth I had thought was going to be in the physical abilities to be able to do it, but there was also, and there was definitely that, but there was also a ton of uh, emotional understanding for myself, like. Like, um, and one of the biggest ones was that I eventually started thinking of it as I have two, there's two feeling states for me. There is caught up in thoughts, which was one. And there was joyful, patient presence. Actually, at the time it was joyful, patient serenity. Now I think of that, that feeling state that I enjoy and, and, you know, love to be in. Um, and I've learned some tools to sort of bring that about. Uh, with some more frequency, but like two, just two, two states of mind, right? Caught up in thoughts or uh, joyful patient now presence, joyful patient presence. And the beauty of that is I used to spend a lot of time trying to like sort of really look at, uh, break down, uh, pull apart what was going on inside me in terms of negative emotions or mood. And it was super not productive for me to sort of be spending my energy deciding if right now I was feeling more guilty or more, you know, uh, I don't even know, like dissatisfied or something like that. Like um, I used to really, really marinate in my own negative, especially emotions. And I almost couldn't conceive of positive emotions. Like I I would, I would be very quick to say, you know, that I, I 
didn't feel a lot of positive emotions or something like that when I was going through something. And, um, and the truth is like, there's just two feeling states for me. There's joyful patient presence and there's caught up in thoughts. And I spend less time caught up in thoughts because of the, of the ways that I've learned to, to, uh, I think it really began with awareness, just noticing, uh, what was going on inside myself without engaging with it, without picking it up or paying attention to it. Right. Um, so I wanted to read the list. George has this wonderful list of like the hallmarks of being in a low mood. So I actually do have the book now. I have a, uh, I have like a physical copy of the book. So I've been reading this and also listening to it in audio. Um, this is, by the way, this is the 25th anniversary edition. So um, it has a whole addendum at the back that I, that will be one of these episodes. Um, and that's really interesting because the addendum is um, George and his wife, Linda, they're both therapists. They really get into how these principles, these ideas made their own marriage better, like made their own marriage good, <laughs> made them happily, helped them be happily married. So uh, yes. So here are some of the hallmarks of low moods, low spirits. Our mental activity, and I'm reading directly from the book here. I want to make that really super clear. These are not my words. These are George's words. Our mental activity or thinking velocity increases. So as we get more thoughts, right? Our thinking gravitates to problems and dissatisfaction. When I'm in a low mood, I'm much more likely to sort of be vocal about um, and thoughtful about, or not thoughtful in a good way, but like thinking about all the crappy stuff in my life or in the world, right? Um, we experience a heightened but distorted sense of immediacy. For example, we think we must do something right away about our circumstances. Um, I feel this, like there's, uh, there's this idea of um, light winds if you're, if you're sailing, right? There can be there can be periods of time where there's not a lot of wind and it can feel like a super emergency. And the best thing to do is to wait it out. Like if we can wait until wind comes along, uh, then we'll be able to move again or, or shift, you know, right. And the same is true of thoughts. Like um, it can feel like we need to do everything right now. We can feel the sense of immediacy, but really we could just wait it out and it'll be okay. You know, it's, the, it's trusting that it'll be okay, I think, is the is the learning shift here. Certainly was for me. Uh, also, we feel self-conscious. It seems we are the center of everybody's attention. And I'm sure you've had it happen where you felt embarrassment or guilt or anger or something like that. And suddenly you 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 just felt like everyone in the world was looking at you, judging you, right? Like that's that's a hallmark of a low mood. Um, we have a pessimistic outlook. We notice limitations and we are blind to possibilities. This one feels really important to highlight because I know when I am in a low mood, that's literally true. Like I see only negatives. I don't, I don't, I don't notice the positives. Um, and we entertain many negative thoughts, emotions, and concerns is, is the last one there. And I, I think one of the reasons I really wanted to bring you this list is because of an experiment that I tried a few weeks ago, and this has been super fascinating. I wanted to understand what part resistance plays in my life. And um, so what I decided to do was track resistance, notice it and write it down. Whenever I felt afraid, whenever I was second guessing decisions and whenever I, um, was found myself avoiding tasks. I imagine that these are probably things that you have experienced somewhere in your life where you felt afraid, you've second guessed yourself, or you have found yourself avoiding tasks without even really knowing why. And I was like, this is great. Like I will, I'll do this for a week and I'll have a better understanding of, of my, my own resistance, right. And where it comes from, what it's about, stuff like that. Well, that did happen the, in the sense of I did get an understanding. I could look back. I can even look back at my notes and see what it was around. But something else was happening that I was totally not aware of while I was, I was tracking the resistance. Um, and that is I started to feel afraid like all the time. I started to feel super afraid Um 
of everything. I, I started to second guess more and more decisions. Um, I, I remember by, so that was, I started tracking on a Sunday, I believe. Pretty sure it was a Sunday. By Tuesday, I was questioning how I was showing up with colleagues. Like, um, we have a peer call on Tuesdays uh, with a, with the, my wonderful global coach community. And, um, I usually for a lot of times on Tuesdays, I'll sit in front of my easel and I will paint as we're talking. Like if I'm the leader, I don't do that because I, my full attention is, is on the people I am serving. Right. But if I'm one of the group, um, it's a really wonderful way to feel a part of the group, right? It's a virtual group. So I'm in my studio and I'm painting and, and, um, it just, I don't know, there's something really wonderful and kind of spiritual about it that is, I found to be absolutely amazing. I've been doing this for many months. Um, anyway, that Tuesday, for the first time, this is two days after I started tracking resistance, the thought comes into my head of like, oh my God, like how incredibly selfish you are to be sitting here at your easel when you should be serving in some other way. You should, be, you should have, like I was sort of giving myself all this responsibility that I didn't in fact have in the moment, right? And what saved me that day or what helped me come back to myself was I watched one of my colleagues who also does this gather their like supplies and, and you know, sit down and, and start painting. And I was like, oh yeah, if they can do it, so can I, it's all good. Uh, by Wednesday, I was sharing with, with my kids that I felt caught in a fear spiral. By Friday, I was questioning like all my relationships. I was questioning even the closest ones. I was feeling incredibly fearful for our world, for myself, for like, you know, for everything. And including like, you know, I should be showing up in these ways that I'm not. And that's why everything is wrong. Like these are like, for me, guilt is a huge huge negative emotion that shows up a lot for me, just kind of based on my, I don't know, the habits that I had created before I uh, did some work around these, right? And um, by Saturday, which was the last day that I tracked resistance, I had completely changed my worldview into one that was super duper fearful, um, disempowering. I felt bad about everything. I couldn't understand how we could move forward in this world. And um and what's interesting is, so I think I've shared about this on the show before, maybe not, but I, for, for probably about 15 months now, I have had a letter to the future <laughs> that I read to myself every morning and every evening. And the commitment that I, what I've made in terms of a commitment is to be in a neutral or positive state of mind in order to be able to read the letter. Um, the first letter there's now, I'm into the second one, which is, I'm into the second year of this, which is really kind of fun. So the first one was dated in September, um, the, the 19th of September, 2024. And, um, that was such a, in some, sometimes it was a super grueling commitment. And if I'm looking at it through the lens of the relationship handbook, um, and this idea of moods coming and going, right. And being able to uh, shift to a neutral or positive feeling state, um, I made that commitment that that's what I would do. And so I did it every single night, even, even when things felt absolutely impossible, like how could it ever be? So, so during this week, I think I was able to really stay myself with clients, um, with even, even twice a day, my just, just inside myself because I still have that commitment and I still, uh, there were times in that week where it was extremely difficult. I remember sitting outside on the back deck, sort of watching the sun set for my evening reading of this letter and just being like, how in the hell can I possibly read this letter right now? And well, it was the commitment that I made to myself. So I did. <laughs> um, and then what would happen is I would be right back in fear basically as soon as I remembered to track it, um, which is what I was doing that week. So the following week, what I did, and this just ended uh, over this past weekend, I tracked uh, a uh, alignment. I tracked when did I feel in flow? When did I feel 
joy? When did I feel like I was doing exactly the right wonderful things that I ought to be doing? When did I feel truly aligned with my values? Right. And um, what's really, I think, especially interesting about that was, and I thought it might be the case, and it turned out to be the case that it would, it took the week of, of tracking alignment in order to sort of unmake most of these thought patterns that had come up in the week of tracking resistance. But like I started to notice, for example, um, by Tuesday, which was a week after I'd had this, like, oh my God, you're so selfish wanting to paint while you're with your friends uh, feeling, I was able to tell them about that. And I felt good. Like I felt supported and loved, you know, I'm just a person on my journey, just like they are. Right. And so I remembered good things in the world. By Wednesday, I remembered um, compassion. By Thursday, I remembered gratitude. By Friday, I remembered loving kindness. And by Saturday, which was the last day that I wrote down and tracked alignment, I remembered wonder. Actually, the, you know what? I realized, I'm realizing, I remembered wonder on Friday and I remembered loving kindness on Saturday. And I know that because... I got to see the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, for the first time ever in person with my own eyes. And not only that, but I got to paint the Aurora Borealis. And I'm I, like, here's something super wild. Speaking of moods, I think if it had been the previous week when I was tracking resistance, I wouldn't have even gone outside. Like I would have just been so overcome with like sadness about missing it or about uh, the the second guessing is it like, am I worthy to paint it? Like these were the sorts of thoughts that were coming up in my head that previous week. And I had the coolest experience where a colleague in the global coach community and I were having this sort of written conversation in the community itself about what is a soul? What does a soul look like? And and I sort of, so at like 7.50 or something, maybe eight o'clock that evening on Thursday evening, I I just, I realized, I th I think my soul looks like the Northern Lights. And so I posted a little gif of the Northern Lights. And then I remembered, like, I literally put the tablet down. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, the Northern Lights are supposed to be out tonight. And I had heard that the best viewing was going to be between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So I was kind of ready to be up late. And now it's like a little bit after eight. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go outside and see. And I went outside and they were just so beautiful. Like, oh my gosh, it was reds. It was, I even got to see some really cool greens. Um, it was the most amazing, quite transformative experience. I mean, I felt like how people describe totality in an eclipse, being in person to, to experience totality in an eclipse. It felt like that. I, I couldn't, I just was gobsmacked. And I remember running inside the house briefly just to shout to, to um, one of my kids and just, and the emotion and the excitement in my voice, I can still hear it now. Like I, I don't, I would not have had the same experience of the Northern Lights if I'd given myself permission to even go seek them <laughs> if it had been the previous week because, because of the difference in what I was tracking. So, so um, you know, when we're in a higher mood, when we're in a, a mood state that feels more positive, um, everything feels better. And and just coming back to the purpose of, of our conversation here, um, experiencing those good feelings is what, like, and I guess even just noticing what is the feeling that we're experiencing, right? What it, What is the mood that we are in? Being able to notice that and be aware of it, um, we'll also notice when it looks to us or when we can observe someone else in a good place or in a, in a, in a tough mood, right? Like, and we can be understanding of others when they feel that way. We can be understanding for ourselves when we feel that way. Um, and we can, you know, we can remember that what helps people and this is this is something that George says a lot in the book is what helps people in a low mood is the feeling of being understood. And so the more we can do to help someone feel understood, the better, right? Um, and I can relate all that to my recent experience where I literally for a week cultivated a low mood and did not even realize I was doing it. 
that was the other thing that was so interesting. It took a colleague to connect the dots for me. I didn't understand that tracking the resistance was causing so much of the the fearful feelings in my in my psyche to show up there. It was just what you pay attention to matters, right? So what we focus on grows. And that is the gist of the um the, the our final chapter that we're talking about today, which is chapter five. Um, it's called Emotions, Master or Servant. And um, I love this. So, so what George basically says is, this is a quote of his, what helps with understanding emotions is simply the awareness of how we are feeling right now. Um, oh, actually, <laughs> that was, those are my notes. <laughs> the quote is down a little bit further. Emotions are garden variety thoughts that have gotten excellent press in the psychological community, he says. Like other thoughts, emotions grow when you pay attention to them. So um, what helps with understanding emotions, if I'm now going to read my own notes, is simply the awareness that they're, they give us a measure of how we are feeling right now. Um, we can accept that moods change. Uh, in fact, George references... Um, if we're in a low mood, we might see our, you know, car, our old car, for example, as a clunker. And if we are in a higher, or, you know, a positive mood, we might see that car as a classic. Like there's, there's, I think that helped me to have an understanding of like the shifting that can happen when we're looking at the same thing. It's just what's happening inside of us is what's causing the shift, right? So emotions are simply thoughts. That's one of my favorite, uh, ideas that comes across in this whole entire book. And um, this chapter, chapter five, really talks, I think, in a great thorough way about how what we focus on grows. And um, we can, if we're having feelings of anger, if we're having feelings of guilt, and we pay attention to them, like they catch us, um, then they're going to grow. Those feelings are going to grow. If we uh, feel a fleeting, um, something that feels like contentment maybe, or, uh, love or, um, you know, messages that feel good to us. Um, and we catch on to those, those feelings are going to grow because that's what happens with emotions. Um, yeah. So that's, that is this, uh, this round of the emotion, uh, the relationship handbook. Um, Next time, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for being here um, as we are talking about these. I think they're pretty revolutionary ideas. They've certainly been very revolutionary in my life um, and with the people that I work with, right? It, the, these are, one of the things I've noticed about this book is they it helps me, a lot of these are things that I understood as a teacher when I was re working with children, right? Like, you, you cannot expect a child, a three-year-old child to be able to regulate their emotions in the way that we would expect that we could. Uh, what's been very interesting is to see that in a lot of ways, I did not regulate my emotions um, or understand my emotions and how they, how they could be viewed. Like I used to think maybe try to control them or I'd just focus on feeling guilty and how bad I felt about that wasn't that helpful. But with a child, I would never expect a child to suddenly be able to, I don't know, control their emotions in a way that, that like I used to think I could do. I would be like, well, this, this is a kid who's learning. So this book helps me remember that I am also a, a person, just like a kid. <laughs> I just happen to be grown up who's learning. And, um, I hope you're enjoying this series and, uh, the sort of ways of thinking about it, right? So um, we will be reading next time chapters uh, six, seven, and eight, and that will be the first Tuesday in November. We will be um, bringing you those. And in the meantime, I'm just wishing you well. Uh, please get in touch with me if you've got questions or um, comments or, or, you know, any thoughts as you're reading along, or if you, if you've, you know, if something's coming up and you're curious about it, let me know. Um, I've recently discovered that my contact page was broken. So it is not broke. Well, it's, there's a repair on the way, <laughs> but what I've done is, is at K 
klockculp.com slash contact. I've now got basically my email address there. So my email address is the letter K. So K, just that one letter, K at klockculp.com is how you can get in touch with me there. You can find me on Instagram at we turned out okay, a Y at we turned out okay. Um, I shortened my LinkedIn uh, page and now I can't remember what it is. I think it's, I, I know this, if you go to LinkedIn, um, you can find me by searching K lock Culp. And um, I have been creating a, uh, what, what I didn't realize this at the time, but uh, art, creativity, and well-being, which will be the name of this podcast pretty soon, has been the name of a publication that I create um, called Art, Creativity, and Well-Being. So uh, I've been sharing art shares there. I've been, um, right now I've got a whole, uh, for the for paid supporters, I've got a curriculum of the tools, uh, sharing uh, learning of the tools that have been really helpful for me on my journey. These are in my book. Um, and they're still the tools that help me today that I, that I sort of, you know, live with or live by, like they're very helpful as I'm on my learning journey. Um, and as I said, I share for free subscribers, I share an art, a piece of art and a story every week. And it's funny because this week, um, the piece of art isn't a painting that I made. It is a physical, like little wonderful thing called a leaf basket. And so that's what I'm sharing about um, in my art share this week. Um, and that is located at Um, And uh, the links to all this will be in the show notes um, in case you want to find me somewhere else and, and, uh, you know, see what else is going on in, in my world. And um, I, I love and appreciate you and and you for being here and for being a part of all this. Um, I'm extending lots and lots of gratitude to you today as I wrap up. Um, and I am also grateful for uh, the amazing autumn experience where I live, which is absolutely spectacular. And right now we've just got all the, all the maples are going and um, there's these beautiful yellow, I don't even know what they are, but there's these beautiful yellow leaves that catch the light behind my house and you get pine needles blowing around and it's all just really, really lovely. So um, I'm really super grateful for that <laughs> as well. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. I wish you very well and uh, join us next time when we will be continuing with our study of the Relationship Handbook. Lots of love to you. Uh, talk soon. Bye-bye.